Are any of you fans of the movie Gladiator? Right, all right. So the, the main character in this movie uh, is the Roman general Maximus, and he's, he's leading, uh, leads the Roman army against the barbarians from the north. And uh, in the opening scene of the movie, Maximus is preparing his troops for battle, and as he does so, he, he, he mounts his horse, and then he calls out to his officers, at my signal, unleash hell. Then he goes to a, a, another group of officers, and he gives them a final rallying cry, which he ends by saying, what we do in life echoes in eternity. There are, are, there's a certain way that the scene of that movie reminds me of today's scripture. Matthew 28, what we just heard, is uh, this passage is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. And it is the very last words of Matthew's gospel. This is how his gospel ends. And this is Jesus' final rally cry to his officers, to his 11 disciples. Jesus turns to the 11 and says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a staggering statement, isn't it? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We talk about the president of the United States as the, the, the most powerful person in the world, the, the leader of the free world. But that's nothing compared to what Jesus is saying here. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is not just the, the leader of one city, the leader of one country, the leader of one part of the world. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. And as such, he gives his officers this command. He gives his disciples this charge. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, at my signal, unleash heaven. At my signal, unleash heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. As Jorge Acevedo puts it, Jesus' dream is for the realities of heaven to become the realities of earth. So he calls his followers to take his movement global to all nations, to all people and places in need of his grace, and he reminds us that what we do in this life echoes in eternity. Each of us has one life to live. Will we spend it making earth more like heaven? Will we spend it transforming the world? The United Methodist Church as a whole has a mission statement that is taken from Matthew 28. Here it is. Here's the mission of the United Methodist Church. To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's the mission of the United Methodist Church. Now, I like this mission statement because it reminds us that our mission is big. Our mission isn't to increase attendance or balance our budget. Our mission is nothing short of the transformation of the world. Our mission is to unleash heaven on earth. That is a big and bold mission. This series on transformation, which we are now in the fifth of six weeks of, this series is based on the vision of our bishop, Reverend Grant Hagia. And he's outlined this vision in the following diagram that we have been looking at each week in this series. This diagram highlights four priorities, transforming lives, transforming leaders, transforming congregations or churches, and transforming the world. Today, we come to the fourth and final priority, transforming the world. And this priority has two key components, global missions and mission field engagement. Now, as I was putting this series together, 
I contacted the person who designed this diagram for the bishop, and, and I asked him, when you say mission field engagement, do you mean local mission field engagement? And he said, exactly. Mission field engagement means seeing our local community, the local community around us as our mission field. Kailua, Windward Oahu, is our mission field. And this means engaging it, loving it for the sake of the gospel. So in this priority, our bishop is calling us to be local and global, which has been something we've been talking about for a few years now. Our vision is to be a global church, local and global in our outreach, local and global in our impact. We want to reach across the street, and we want to reach around the world. That's our vision as a church. And what drives this vision is God's love. As we hear in John 3.16, such a well-known verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. To be global is to demonstrate God's love locally and globally. Local mission field engagement is about demonstrating God's love. Global missions is about demonstrating God's love. And, and I say this because at times the church has gotten it wrong in the name of missions. In the name of missions, the church has harmed people or taken from them or used them rather than love them, both in other parts of the world and even here in Hawaii. So when we say our vision is to be global, that we want to be global in our mission, that means that our vision is to demonstrate God's love locally and globally. Now this local work that we're called to do involves addressing people's spiritual needs as well as addressing their financial and material physical needs, caring for the soul and caring for the body, doing evangelism and social justice. Now for Methodists, these two go hand in hand. On the one hand, Wesley wrote, you have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. And go always not only to those that want you, but to those that want you most. You have nothing to do but save souls. This is a call to evangelism. Not to beat people over the head with the Bible, but to go to those who want you most, as Wesley puts it, and to share with them the gospel. To invite them in our words and in our actions to become followers of Jesus, to, to experience a new life in Christ. Early Methodists were deeply committed to evangelism. They were also deeply committed to social justice, to addressing people's physical, material, financial needs. They were involved in prison reform and uh, education for children and the abolition of slavery. They started health clinics and, and offered microloans for the poor. Early Methodists did so much to, to transform British society that about a century ago, there was a, a well-known historian, a French historian, that theorized that the Wesleyan revival created England's middle class and saved England from the kind of bloody revolution that France experienced. The Methodist revival transformed British society. Early Methodists cared for people's souls and their bodies, and these two go hand in hand. I'd like to give you an example of this from Grace United Methodist Church. Uh, this is a church in southwest Florida, um, and I've been reading a book about this church, and I, I mentioned it uh, a couple of weeks ago. But one of this church's stated goals is to lower the crime rate in their community. Isn't that kind of a cool goal? I've never been part of a church that has said one of our goals is to lower the crime rate in our community. That, but that's one of this church's specific goals. 
And to this end, in, in 2007, this church purchased an old grocery store that had been sitting uh, empty for years. And they purchased it in order to turn it into a community center. And that's what they'd done. And in it, they put a food bank, uh, a thrift store, an after-school drop-in ministry for high school students. They started offering services like uh, GED classes and medical screening, cooking classes, AIDS testing, mammograms, haircuts, a community garden, and more. Just a ton of services to their community. They, they created a, a holistic community center to address the social and financial needs in their community. And doing so has opened doors for them to address the spiritual needs in their community. I'll give you a specific example. Several years ago, there was a, a woman named Kim, and she approached one of the pastors at Grace to talk to him about her husband. Her husband's name is Jim, and at the time, Jim was drinking a, a fifth of vodka a day, kind of washing that down with a 12-pack of beer and throwing in a handful of Vicodin. And um, Kim was basically a, a codependent spouse who was enabling her husband to continue living this lifestyle. And when the pastor of the church came and spoke to her, he encouraged Kim to join one of the, the women's codependency groups that the church sponsored. And she did. And she became more connected to the church. And on Father's Day of that year, her husband Jim, Jim came with her to church. It was one of those dragged him to church, right? Please come to church with me. It's Father's Day. He came. He was hungover. But he heard the sermon. And at the end of the service, all of the men were invited to come forward to pray. And Jim came forward, and something clicked. The Holy Spirit did something in his life, because later that week, he checked himself into a rehab center. Fast forward to today. Years later, Jim and Kim are married, and they lead the church's marriage ministry. And Jim is a gifted, a passionate evangelist. In fact, he's preached at numerous churches in India. Jim has been transformed through God's Spirit. And that is a, a result that flows out of Grace Church's holistic commitment to serve their community. Being a, a local church means reaching out in a holistic way locally and globally. So how are we doing that as a church? This is a message that calls us to go, right? Matthew 28 says, go. So how are we called to go into our community and into the world? As far as our local outreach, when it comes to evangelism, that's what we talked about last week, being incarnational, knowing our context and reaching out to it in ways that people understand each small group brainstormed this week how we can be incarnational. And it was great to get the emails that the small group leaders were sending to each other. How can we reach out to single parents? How can we reach out to military families with deployed spouses? How can we reach out to folks in their 20s? These are all kind of brainstorm ideas that small groups had. How can we share the gospel? When it comes to what we do locally as far as meeting people's needs, I'm well aware that the most of the ways we do that, I don't even know about. Because our church isn't a building, right? Our church is us. Our church is you. You are the church. And there are ways that you are loving people around you that I don't even know about. There are ways that you are serving the needs of our community that I don't even know about. It's always dangerous when you start naming names, but I can think of so many people just looking at you who are involved in serving our community and blessing it. I mean, it's remarkable all the ways that you all are doing that as an extension of our ohana. I want to mention just a few that we're doing as a church together. And I don't think these will be new, but as you hear one of these, if there's a way that you want to jump in, go, contact the person. We have the Beacon of Hope House. It is for women that coming out of prison here in Kailua. It is a home for them to get back on their feet. It's an amazing ministry. Not very many people in our church are connected to it. I think the person currently in our church who's most involved is Selma Oishi. And I think, I don't know, someone's probably down with Sunday school. But if you would like to connect with Beacon of Hope House, I would invite you to, to contact Selma um, and see how you can do that. We're also involved in, in IHS. And I know we talk about this, the Institute for Human Services. But we serve dinner every fourth Saturday. And John Musser, who is out of town, 
He is our coordinator, but I've already seen his email, and he needs people on September 23rd. I know sometimes folks say, I didn't even know we do that every month, but we do it every fourth Saturday. If you're free on September 23rd, there's a group that preps from 2.30 to 4.30, and there's a group that serves from 5.45 to 6.45, and we're looking for servants who can serve in either of those times on September 23rd. We also serve, as many of you know, with Family Promise. And that is where families that would otherwise be living on the streets or living in their car, they come and they live on our campus. Now, what's unique is that at the end of this year, Family Promise is going to come and be here for two weeks in a row. <laughs> and I've never seen that before. And they basically said, no church is open. We know you're already doing one week. Can you do two in a row? And I'll tell you, it was not a slam dunk decision when our church council talked about this. Because it is an inconvenience, and it does, it kicks the choir and uh, small groups and different groups that are meeting there, they're gone for the week. But our leader said, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're celebrating Jesus' birthday <laughs> on December 24th. We're going to open up our church on December 24th for two weeks of family promise. So the last week, starting Christmas Eve, family promise will be here, and the first week in January. But you could volunteer to bring a meal, um, to serve as an overnight person who stays uh, in Kellaway. That's a really practical way to be involved. I want to mention just a couple other things. I think we're all aware of just what's going on with, with homelessness in our community. And, and there's a gathering that's coming up. It's on Thursday, September 14th at 6.30, uh, sorry, at 6 p.m. at Daybreak Church which is, used to be called Faith Baptist. This is church on just the other side of um, the YMCA. But this is a gathering for church uh, members. It's a gathering for local organizations and nonprofits as well as city and social agencies. So if that's a, that, that's a concern, an issue on your heart, I'd invite you to come to that meeting Thursday, September 14th, 6 p.m. at Daybreak Church. I want to mention one other way, and that's uh, with the Blue Zones Project. How many of you have ever seen Blue Zone Projects signs up, right? Restaurant schools. I've seen some of those. So the Blue Zones crew were, were at our summer fest. And so one of the persons who helps lead that came and said, can I meet with you? And I said, yes. And it's, 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 a, it's a wellness initiative. It's a community-based wellness initiative based on research from around the world. How do people live well and live longer? And they came up with nine basic principles. Nine, yes, this many, nine. Now, one of the nine that I think is so interesting, one of the nine is uh, being in a faith-based community. And here's the principle based on research. Participating in a faith-based community can add up to 14 years to your life. Can you turn to a neighbor and say, I am extending my life today. Wow, participating in a faith-based community can add up to 14 years to your life. That's based on research. That's not something a pastor came up with. So, but the, the Blue Zone Initiative, they're working with different agencies, and one of them is faith-based groups. And they're hoping that faith-based groups can be a, a community sponsor and be participant. This person met with me, but if it stays with me, I will clog it up, I will slow it down. It doesn't work. So if that interests you, wellness kind of ideas, can you come and speak to me? Because we're looking for someone who can just kind of spearhead this, be the point person to, to kind of see how we as a church may get involved in this. So if that interests you, come and speak to me. These are just some of the ways that we're seeking to, to reach out locally. And our point in doing so is to unleash heaven. That's why we're doing that. So how about globally? How are we reaching out globally? The first way is through our giving, through our tithes and offerings. Uh, we don't talk a lot about this, but as a Methodist church, a portion of our giving goes towards what we call apportionments. And, and apportionments go in different places, but one is to the World Service Fund. And the World Service Fund has four areas of focus, developing Christian leaders, starting new churches, ministering with the poor, and stamping out killer diseases. So some of what we give automatically, just through our Methodist system, goes out to the rest of the world. Do any of you remember the Imagine No Malaria campaign? You know, that's something that the Methodist Church has been pushing, and we have a long ways to go, but you know, in the, in the last um, about, I think it's about eight years that we've been doing that and focusing on that, the number of deaths by malaria in the world has been cut in half. 
We still have a long way to go. But isn't that amazing? Global deaths by malaria cut in half. And that's something that the Methodist church has taken the lead in really spearheading and working on. As I'm sure most of you are aware, one way we've also sought to be global is with our partnership with our church in, in Indi India. And that church was uh, started by my brother Jeremy, his wife Joy, and they, they pastor that church. And we've been supporting that church financially in different ways for about three years now. Two years ago, we sent a team. And this year, on September 22nd, which someone just told me, that's not very far away. On September 22nd, we're sending a team to India for two weeks. Now, a few days ago, I asked my brother, how did our team impact your church? And here's what he said. I want to share what he wrote uh, about our church. He said, your team brought a lot of unity to our church through the leadership retreat you led. Our members felt encouraged that outsiders care about us. Everything you taught, the material, the style, the workshops, is different than what a village can expect here to receive. It was all practical stuff that our church really needed. Joy and I felt very supported by your team, and it pushed us to plan for the future. The egg drop and the noodle marshmallow houses caught their attention and resulted in many people who normally don't share, sharing. Deborah's laughing because Deborah was part of that. She led that. And then he wrote this, the team's dancing cemented our church as a dancing church. If foreigners who love God can dance, then so can we. Especially everyone loved Tim's interactive dancing. You know, whenever my impact in India is mentioned, nothing is ever said about preaching, only dancing. Uh, teamwork in our church has increased. Your church also blessed us with an outside kitchen, which we urgently needed. You financed the baptismal, and I think you really helped create the can-do attitude that our youth have, as seen in all their night work, their all-night work to dig out the baptismal. Youth in their church spent all might digging out this, this baptismal to get it in place. Um, after you left, we had 11 people get baptized, which was a huge number for us, and most of these 11 have become key leaders for us. Your church also funded the railing, which made our upstairs usable, even though it isn't complete. You also gave us money for the tables for the tutoring. Because of Ed's scholarship, I know Ed is here today, because of Ed's scholarship, three people got their driver's license, one of whom, Minaj, uh, is, is dropping people off each week after the Saturday night youth meeting. Many more have practiced driving as evidenced by uh, the ruined clutch and multiple scratches on our car. <laughs> you also gave money for the clothes that we sponsor for all the participants in our Christmas program. We as a church have and will face many challenges, such as racism and discrimination because of who our church is. But you helped our people look beyond that and hope in the Lord and believe in transformation for themselves. The sincerity of your team and the relationship we have with you makes your support not seem like impersonal charity, but that you love our church from your heart. In short, you have blessed our church a lot, and its growth is inspiring. Thank you for being local. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for demonstrating God's love to people in India. As we prepare for our, our, our team going again, we asked them what would bless you. And Jeremy responded by saying that the church got together, they discussed this, they prayed over it, and that, all the, that uh, among our leaders there was a consensus that the flooring of the stage in the, in, the, in the sanctuary in the church is an urgent need and will truly help us in our effort to complete the church and will give the believers a boost of hope. This is a 700-square-foot area, and their goal is to floor it in granite. I know, so serious. So for the leaders and members of their church who have historically been just basically put down and denied access to many things, having a church that they can be proud of, coming to a church that is beautiful, it is inspiring to them. And it, it, as my brother put it, it inspires hope in them and confidence for their future. So the cost of the cement, the sand, the wood, the granite slab, the labor, it comes out to just over $3,000. And Jeremy said we could buy the granite while we're there, and we think that would be a good thing for your team as well as for our church. So that's our current project, is to help them complete this part of, of their church. And their church is growing in their outreach. And if you'd like to give to that, you can do it in any, at any time. If you'd like to give, just note for India. 
That's the current project we're working on. And once again, in reaching out in this way, our goal is to unleash heaven. Jesus says to us what he said to the disciples on the mountain. He says to us, therefore, go. Go into Kailua. Go into the world and make disciples. Jesus says to us, on my signal, unleash heaven, church. Because what you do in this life echoes in eternity. Let's pray. God, we thank you for loving our world so much that you sent your son. And we thank you for the privilege of being part of what you're doing in the world. And we ask you to bless Kailua, bless Windward Oahu. God, bless Hawaii. We ask your blessing on our nation and on our world, God. And speak to us about the ways you're calling us to go. Guide us in being local, in reaching across the street and around the world, God. We just make ourselves available to you. God, we just come before you as a church and we say, here we are, send us. Where you send us, God, we will go. And God, as we pray for our world, we certainly pray for Florida. God, we have a lot of written prayer requests that came up to me this morning, and they are all for Florida. And almost all of them are from members of our church who have family and friends in Florida. We pray for these families and these friends, God. We pray for just safety. We pray for encouragement. We pray for peace. We pray for those who are serving in different capacities. God, we're seeing this unfold right now. Um, and we just pray for your hand to be ministering to this part of the world. And God, on the, uh, as, we, as we remember 9-11 tomorrow, God, we just pray also for our nation and for our world, God. We pray for your kingdom to come. We pray for your peace. God, we acknowledge that our world needs you. We need you. God, we pray for those who are serving in the military. Think of members of our church who are uh, on deployment in different parts of the world. We pray for them. We pray for their family members. We ask you to strengthen them. And God, we offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.